it's also very gratifying to me to see just so much kind of interest in this topic because I think particularly uh, maybe a little bit selfishly um, having applicants and people in our cohorts from the region just make my job much more rewarding it makes the courses more interesting and I think ultimately it, it makes the field and all of our work just better when we can kind of have this broader perspective and that um, is unfortunately kind of lacking. So I, I also just want to stay off at the outset, you know, that I'm I'm a assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, I'm just kind of giving my own kind of perspective here. So this shouldn't be kind of taken as, as gospel or any type of institutional stand. Um, and what I kind of want to do is just walk through maybe a little bit more of kind of some of the mechanics about the application process. And some of this uh, touches on and really builds on some of the things that uh, that Rich has said. And so when you think about how your particular folder comes through an application process, you can think about it in two ways as kind of there being kind of successive hoops that you have to jump through. And so when you know, I or, or someone is kind of sitting down at the and, and looking at all of these files. I think the first question that we often kind of ask ourselves is, is almost like a simple, like a yes, no question about, is this person prepared to succeed in the political science program? And that's kind of a, you know, there's some simple things that go into that. I mean, are the grades and the classes uh, where they should be? I mean, we don't have a you know, high cut point or anything like that. We just want to see like, are people above the bar? Is it believable? Have they taken kind of courses and done the types of things that we think are, are pretty strong predictors of success? We'll also look for things like, uh, do you have some background in maybe some language instruction? Do you have some kind of mathematical background? Uh, do you have some experience with the place that you're planning to study? And kind of the point of that is just more of like a, it's it's hard to take somebody who doesn't know any language and doesn't have any mathematical background and doesn't have any experience in the place where they want to study and tool them up in kind of all the things they need and give them that political science theoretical education in the time that we have. So we like to look for some evidence that somebody's kind of already, um, you know, taken some steps in that direction. I think kind of a one of the things that that Rich said also is that it's really important for us to get a sense from the file that somebody knows what graduate level political science training is about. Uh, I know, I mean, I must have be getting some of these same files that that Rich has gotten where people say, I love talking about politics. Uh, I've always talked about politics as a kid, or I wanna sometimes I want to become a politician. Uh, those might be true, but it doesn't really raise confidence that you kind of understand what you're really about to get into. And I think it kind of, it would be a real disservice if we brought you into a program and imposed this lifestyle on you uh, and you got into it a couple years and realized, boy, this is not what I thought I was signing up for. So those tend to be kind of quick things that we check off. We also look at things like, or, or I tend to look at things like, is are the research plans that this person has are they safe are they ethical are they feasible those are important things uh and as you know as as richard mentioned you're not tied to a project you can obviously change and you can learn but that's also kind of a way of just thinking of kind of what are the things that this person is is going to be like as a graduate student um to switch over to the statements I, I would totally agree with Rich, you know, for, for the personal statement, it's, it's not a narration of your CV. So you shouldn't spend your time kind of walking through the stuff that, you know, you, you got a diploma from so-and-so or whatever. That's not really what it's about. It's more about kind of you justifying why you want to get a PhD, why you want to have training in political science. And so, as Rich said, I would totally agree with this, is that the best statements that, that I have tended to read are kind of question and problem driven. Like, why does something happen? How does something happen? Those are the ones that are really kind of getting you engaged and getting me thinking about, okay, here's what this person likes, here's what they care about, here's what we at you know, the University of Wisconsin can do for them, here's where our interests converge. 
This is somebody I want in my seminars. This is somebody I want to brainstorm with in my office. It's, it's these types of things that really kind of set these uh, statements off on and, and get them off on a good foot. And I would also kind of echo Rich as well that think about what your comparative advantage is, right? There's something that makes you an absolutely outstanding candidate, even compared to the other candidates who have super high scores and all these kind of other bells and whistles with their application. There's something you do that is special and build on it, like highlight it and build on it. I think one of the other kind of issues that we often see in some of these statements is that individuals are not super invested in understanding that a political science PhD trains you to do a very specific type of thing. And if you want to do other things, there's probably better ways to spend your time. And so we often see this when individuals are completely kind of concerned with methodological questions, right? And so if you want to study machine learning, there's probably better ways to do that than taking six years to get a PhD in political science. So just really kind of we're looking for kind of an understanding of what political science is going to, to give to this person. I would also say that in your statement, it's really, really worthwhile to explain your weaknesses. So look through your file, your entire file. If there's you know, one year of your undergrad where you got bad grades, you can take the opportunity in your statement to maybe explain why that happened. I had to care for a sick relative or something like that. And again, this is like, like for what Rich is talking about, where you want to kind of give your ammunition for somebody to advocate for you. So when somebody says, well, their GPA isn't as high as it should be, you can say, well, it's because they were caring for a sick relative. It's kind of like trying to think through what these processes are, are, are going, to, going to be like. So that's kind of the first cut, right? Where we could just kind of say this person is above the bar, or below the bar. The next hoop that you jump through is one that's more about fit. And so here, this is kind of a little bit more random. It just depends on a lot of factors that you, you don't control. Some of them, obviously you can, right? You can look at what the scholars at the department are studying and make sure that your interests are kind of aligned with those. If the department doesn't have a scholar on kind of Middle East politics, then you probably shouldn't apply there if you want to study Middle East politics. That's kind of an easy thing to think of. And it also gives us a chance at this kind of next stage, once you've kind of cleared that initial bar, to say to our colleagues, hey, this person mentioned you in their application. They would like to work with you. Take a look at this file and tell me what you think, right? And, and not having that is kind of... Uh, it makes our job a lot more difficult and it makes us question whether we can provide that support for, for that particular candidate. And I think there's a couple ways to do this. I mean, one is obviously spend time on the program's websites. Look at what the, look at what the faculty have written. Focus on, you know, particularly their recent work, you know, see what they're into right now. Um, you can totally communicate with them or you can email them and ask them, you know, are you taking new students? What are the things you're working on? Here's my idea. Is it interesting to you? You can totally do that and you should feel free to reach out. And all of this is kind of helping you write that statement that really does kind of a nice job of personally connecting you as someone, of talking about your project in a way that's memorable and meaningful rather than just kind of a drive-by. And we often see kind of people who have written personal statements and sent it to the University of Wisconsin at Madison, but forgotten to take out references to, you know, MIT. And they'll say, I want to come to the University of Wisconsin, Madison to study religion and politics with Rich Nielsen. And on the one level, like it's just sloppiness, like we're all sloppy and these things sometimes happen. But on the other, it's just kind of like if all you're doing is just plugging and playing with your different names, it's kind of a sign that you're engaging with things superficially, right? And so if you want to study religion and politics through, you know, advanced computational methods, and maybe Rich is the person, so you should write that in your statement of purpose rather than just a bland statement on religion and politics where you can switch in and out. Um, just a last word here on the letters, too. I think a letter is something that you do have a little bit of control over. Uh, one of the things that is often helpful in my experience, particularly for international applicants, is if you can kind of have a letter from somebody who is trained in the US or in Europe, 
or is at the least kind of familiar with kind of academia in the US and Europe. It's just allows us to get a little bit more understanding when they can talk about you in kind of the relative terms. Uh, and that makes it a little bit easier for us to judge your um, to judge your, your, your packet. I think also it's worth just taking a realistic look at your packet, just like with your statement, you're trying to say, where is my packet weak? How can I make it stronger? I think the letter is another way to think about where your weaknesses are and maybe be a little proactive and kind of trying to choose writers. And you can always help letter writers by suggesting things that you think they should highlight, right? They may not take your advice, but you can feel free to offer this and say, you know, here's something I'm worried about. Here's something that I think you are particularly well placed to speak to, so on and so forth. And finally, on the letters, I think there's there's often a tendency to pick big name scholars or to pick like somebody whose name you think is going to really kind of ring a bell in an admissions committee. But by and large, you also have to kind of judge like how informative that letter is going to be. If you pick a big name scholar and they write you a three or four sentence kind of thing that could be written about anyone, that doesn't really help us. If you have a junior scholar who spends three pages talking about specific things that you do, that is much, much more helpful. So you should try and balance those things. And then lastly, as I'll say as a close, if you apply and you don't get in, you can always reapply. There's no harm in that. You should definitely think about that as an option, but you can also email the graduate director and you could just ask them for some basic feedback on your application. They may not give it, right? Time is at a crunch. There may be other issues there, but you can always ask for things that, you know, maybe could make the application stronger in the next go round. Okay, thank you.